Hello, I'm A.D. Hobbs, and this is going to be my review of Back to the Future Part 3. And this time I have some visual aid. Here we have a, a locomotive train, yeah. Okay. Now, everyone knows the image of the locomotive train, even though we have more modern electric trains now. Yeah, kids love the image of the, the original choo-choo train like that, yeah. And of course, this is integral to the plot of Back to the Future 3. Oh, and the other visual aid I have is over here. This is cartoons or caricatures of characters from... Back, uh, except this is Back to the Future 2, not Back to the Future 3. So, okay. okay, I'll say a few things about Back to the Future 2 first. Um, here we have that was fingerprint identification. Um, over here we have putting rubbish in the DeLorean instead of plutonium. Yeah, so that, that's very cost-effective. Um, and of course, hoverboards, yes, hoverboards. That's the main thing everyone remembers. And, uh, oh, it's over here, a vest that gives you sound effects, yeah. <laughs> and just a few things about, in Back to the Future 2, um, the character of Biff in the alternate 1985 is, is evil, horrendous, corrupt and powerful, but is beloved by all. He's America's number one citizen, yeah, a real folk hero, you know. That sounds familiar. <laughs> In real life, we have some celebrities that are horrible, horrendous people, but they are, they have a good reputation, they're beloved by all. Yes, and I'm not saying all celebrities are horrible, obviously not, no, I'm just saying that unless you know someone personally, you don't really know them. You don't know a person just because you've seen them on the telly, yeah. And also, in Back to the Future 2, Marty McFly is the original person to come up with the idea of using the time machine for a financial gain, you know, betting on the winners with these sports almanac. And Dr. Brown says, no, that's a moral. I didn't invent the time machine for that. It is not for financial gain. So the moral of the story is, the desire for money is wrong. But at the very beginning, literally the very beginning of Back to Future 2, he has a four-wheel drive car, a 4 by 4 So what does that mean? The desire for money is wrong, but it's okay to have a 4 by 4 Okay, that's logic there, okay. Okay, back to the future free. Um, I saw it when uh, I was I was ten years old. <clears throat> it was the first Back to the Future film I saw in the cinema, and it was yes, um, I saw it like the summer holidays had only just started, and you're really excited when that happens when you're a kid. It was my best friend's birthday. That's why we went to see it. Went to see it with a group of friends. Um, back to the Future free in the cinema, and we all loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah. And this was just the beginning, you know, after that the summer holidays were, were, were well away, well underway. So, um, yeah, Back to Future 3 will always be special to me because, um, yeah, I associate it with that memory. And also, Back to Future 3 is my favourite of the trilogy. For a long time, the first one was my favourite, but then afterwards I kind of like the third one better. Because um, Back to Future doesn't really have an ending. Back to Future 2 doesn't really have an ending. Back to Future 3, everything comes full circle. There's no more unanswered questions. It's all... The, the, everything is set. The, the wheel has come full circle. I do like 1 and 2, yeah. Just something about the third one I liked a bit better. And, um... I guess I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of the 1950s. You know? <laughs> That's not my favourite time period, no. And also, the second one was a bit too much to take in in one go. You know, we have three different settings. The past, the present, and the future three aspects of time and the third but the third one is a bit more down to earth and uh, I loved cowboy films when I was a kid yeah I loved western so yeah that's, that sound it suited me yeah so um but the first and the second one help you understand what's going on the third one better yeah okay so um well first of all I didn't see back to future films in the right order I saw the first one then I saw the third one then a few years later saw the second one and uh, my two friends, all they, all they talked about was the hoverboard. They thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And that's all I needed to know, really, because, uh, yes, we see the hoverboard in a, in a part of the story in a scene in Back to the Future 3. Yeah, Back to the Future 2 had a big influence. I remember on TV there was a show called Kappa 2 and a show called The Girl from Tomorrow. And things were the theme of the future, you know, people from the future. Yeah, because of the success of Back to the Future 2, that's why. Anyway, um, so in other words, <clears throat> I saw the Back to the Future Part 1, then saw Back to the Future Part 3. So in the opening sequence, I was just as bewildered as Dr. Emmett Brown. 
to see Marty McFly suddenly appear out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I was just as confused as him because I hadn't seen the second one. So, um, when uh, he sends the, the, the original one, if you like, to, to 1985, and then Marty suddenly shows up and he says, it can't be, I've just sent you back to the future. And Marty says, yes, you did, you did send me back to the future, but I'm back from the future. He says, great, Scott. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes, it was all very confusing. Um, but um, although it is a sequel, obviously, Back to Future 3 is a good story in, in itself, on its own, so, so that's good. And, um, oh yeah, there's, uh, um, th there are some blue, okay, I'll say a few bloopers in the story. Um, Back to Future 3, when, it, when Maya McFly is in the year 1955, this is the second time he's been there, and he finds out Dr. Brown is in the year 1885 from the letter, and he also finds out he wants to stay there. So, but he tells him where he can find the drawing so that he so that he can go home. He needs the help of the fifties doctor to repair the DeLorean. A few bits and pieces need to be put right. Then they find the grave of Doctor Brown. He's only been in the old west a matter of weeks, and he's been killed by Mad Dog Tannen. And so he has to go back to eighteen eighty five to warn him and and then bring him back home. However, here's the problem. Why was it so necessary to go to 1885? Why didn't Miley McFly just tell Dr. Emmett Brown what well, he he's told him, and then he'll remember it in the future, and then he'll know not to stay in 1885 and go home? <laughs> so that problem solved. You didn't need to do all that, yeah. But then you could say, would you remember something 30 years later? Well, you could write it down in a letter, you know, do not open until 1985, and keep that. Then he knows he's going to get shot by Mad Dog Tanner, and then and then just go home like that. So, <laughs> yes, but then um, we wouldn't have the story if he did that. Yeah. Another thing that's unnecessary in the story is this: they need the oh, they need the locomotive to push the DeLorean along. The reason for this is because they they don't have petrol or gasoline. Well, they did, but um, it has a hole in it from the arrow from the Indians, and. Um, Mr. Fusion controls the time circuits, but petrol controls the wheels. So, um, Dr. and Brown tries to come up with some sort of substitute for petrol, tries different formulas, and breaks the engine badly, and says to Marty, it'll take me a month to repair that. Marty says, we don't have a month. You're going to get shot in a few days. We've got to get out of here now. How can we get out of here really, really fast? And then, and then they see the train on cue, going along the route, and think, and Dr. and Brown goes, that's the answer. If the DeLorean was pushed, yes, at 88 miles per hour, then it, but a, a railway train can only do about 50 miles or 80 miles an hour, so they have to modify it a bit to make it go faster. Then it can send us home. And that makes a really spectacular action sequence at the end. However, because I've seen the film many times, I suddenly realised, OK, but Mad Dog Tannen, at a certain point in the story, is put in prison. So he's not going to shoot anyone. So why this insane rush to leave immediately? You know, you don't need to leave immediately anymore. You don't need to do the thing with the train anymore. You just have to fix the DeLorean, uh, fix the engine, g find the formula that would take a month to, to, to and, and then just leave in the DeLorean like that. The whole thing of the train was unnecessary. <laughs> but they didn't think of that. They hadn't put as much thought into it as me, you know. And I guess maybe Dr. and Brown wanted to leave immediately because he thought, well, Clara doesn't love me anymore, so there's nothing to stay here for, so I'm just going to go home. I'm a man of science, I know I don't belong here, so I'm going to go back to 1985. Then, when he's on the train, and when it's already moving at breakneck speed, Clara says she loves him. So, <laughs> hell of a time to tell me that, you know. And then he manages to rescue her when she's upside down, and Mike McFly gives him the hoverboard, yeah. Yeah, so it's good that uh, my friends have told me about the hoverboard, otherwise I wouldn't know what the heck that thing was, yeah. And, um, but I'm not saying that, that it's a bad movie, no, it it is. One one big improvement I liked was, um, well, as I said before, in Back to Future 1, Mighty McFly's girlfriend, Jennifer Parker, we barely see her in number one. In Back to Future 2, she has even less screen time, so she is just the love interest of the hero, and that's it. They don't give her anything to do. In Back to Future 3, yes, Clara, Dr. Emmett Brown's girlfriend, she has loads of screen time. Yes, she is a vital part of the story. So I thought that was good, giving a strong-willed woman character, yeah. 
And um, yeah, I remember before I saw the film, I saw a clip from it, and it's made clear Dr. Hunt Brown finds love. And I thought, but you can't fall in love with someone from a different time period. No, you have to stick to your own time period. Or do you? You know, whatever happened to love conquers all, you know? <laughs> yeah. And at first, because Dr. Hunt Brown says you can't, you know, mess about with the space-time continuum, it might interfere with future events. But then he thinks she's dead. Well, no, she's not really dead. She's legally dead. She's officially dead because she was supposed to fall off down the ravine. So it won't interfere with the timeline at all if they fall in love. But even if she hadn't been killed in the ravine, you know, just be careful. Be careful not to interfere with future events. Yeah. Anyway, um, she is some woman. Yes, yeah, she's an inter intellectual, a lady of science, knows lots of stuff and everything. And Doc Brown talks of her for hours. You know, <laughs> they, they, you can't get enough of her. Yeah, and it's, it's crazy, you know, to fall in love just after a few days. Yeah. So it's good that, yeah, everything came full circle. Dr. Hunt Brown had no desire to marry before, but he met one amazing woman, yeah. And, um, yeah, he does hint in the second one that my only regret is I won't get to see my favourite time period, the Old West, yeah. And um, clearly the, uh, the, the makers of Back to Future films were film buffs, yes. In the first film, Back to Future, we see um, a hand turning into a fist in slow motion, like that. That is um, a tribute to the movie The Time Machine. There's a bit where someone who's never picked a fight before, his hand slowly turns into a fist. In Back to Future 2, um, Mike McFly loses all control when anyone calls him chicken. He says, nobody calls me chicken, nobody. That's a tribute to the movie Rebel Without a Cause. And, of course, in Back to Future 3, Mike McFly fashions a primitive bulletproof vest. That's a tribute to Fistful of Dollars. And, um... Well, the thing is, um, when uh, Buford, Buford Tannen, so Buford, that's Biff's great-great-grandfather, challenges Mike McFly to a fight to the death, <laughs> he agrees to it at first, but then afterwards, his, Seamus McFly, his great-great-grandfather, says not to do it. It's a stupid idea. And Dr. Hunt Brown advises him not to do it as well. You can't fight to the death just because someone calls you a coward. You know, nobody will think any of the worst of you if you decline, if you refuse to fight. In other words, fights to the death, gunfights, they did go on in the Old West a lot. But it was still a bad thing, though. It was still a horrible thing. You know, it wasn't... I know Hollywood glamorises it, but it was, it's a horrible thing, people fighting over such petty things. So, um... And, of course, they were illegal. <laughs> it's completely illegal. And um, they went on a lot, but that doesn't make it OK. And um, so Mighty McFly refuses to fight the bully, you know. Which, but how about this? In the first Back to Future movie, it's made the moral of the story is you must stand up to a bully. But in the third one, the moral is don't stand up to a bully. <laughs> well, no, no, I don't think that's. I think the moral is don't fight a bully if you can help it. You know, fighting is a last resort. If you're left with no other choice, then do it, yes. And Mike McFly refuses, says, I forfeit. You can call me a coward all you like. I'm not fighting to the death. It's, it's such a ridiculous petty thing to do. And then Buford says, if you don't fight me, I'm going to kill Doc Brown. Oh, right, so he's, he's going to have to do it now, yeah. But of course, he fools Biff into thinking that he's won the fight when he hasn't really. He has a master plan. And um, I just want to talk about the Back to Future films in general now. Something that repeats itself, like poetry, repeats itself. Biff ends up covered in manure in all three films, uh, from a different angle, but the same gag, you know. Um, Marty runs out of a bar really quickly, gets on a skateboard, runs out of another bar really quick, gets on a hoverboard, runs out of a, of a saloon, and almost gets hanged, but then gets saved at the last minute. So, yes, yes, that repeats itself. The other thing that repeats itself is um, the, uh, the photograph changing. Yes, the photograph of Mike McFly's siblings disappearing. The photograph of his father who's been killed, but then that changes, so he hasn't been killed anymore. And the photograph of the gravestone. Originally it says Dr. Brown, then there's no name on it, but the gravestone's still there. Then they stop it, and then and then the name disappears completely. So, so yes, the photograph disappearing or photograph changing, that's a consistent in all three films. Oh, just one point, though. Seamus McFly says that, you know, fighting to the death is a stupid thing. And um, then there's this big fight between Buford Tannen and Minor McFly. 
He calls himself Clint Eastwood. That that's a gag because they haven't heard of Clint Eastwood. Of any, anyway. So Martin McFly, aka Clint Eastwood, Buford Tannen are going to have a fight to the death, and um, then all the other spectators watch it. They all disapprove of fights to the death. Why doesn't anyone stop it? Why doesn't anyone do anything to stop the fight? You know, the people of the town, they outnumber Buford and his gang about 10 to 1. Why don't they all just, you know, step in and say, no, no, stop, stop, there's going to be no gunfire here. No, nobody does anything to stop it. They just sit back and watch it happen. If they disapprove so much, why do they sit back and watch it, you know? It's not a Punch and Judy fight. It's life or death, you know, <laughs> so... Yes, they all say they disapprove, but they haven't got the ball to do anything to stop it, even though they outnumber Buford and his gang. And then finally, a lawman comes in, points a gun at Buford Tannen. A bit late, because the fight's over now. <laughs> but, uh, yes, eventually a lawman stops the fight. And um, so, yes, there are obviously bloopers here and there, but it's still a very entertaining story. And there's lots of in-gags, you know, and stuff, because my McFly knows stuff about the future. And when he shoots those those metal things that come out, he shoots them with a gun, they fall down. It's like the 19th century equivalent of a computer game. Yeah, <laughs> shooting things like that. So yeah, we see the ancient equivalent of stuff from his time. And you see that this time period is not so very different from your own, yeah. And um, okay, uh, at the very end of Back to the Future Part 3, uh, Mike McFly comes clean and tells Jennifer Parker... You didn't dream at all. You really did go back and forwards in time. It all really happened. And then afterwards, um, oh, but before he does that, he's he's on the, the, the railway train, pushes the DeLorean along, and then he goes for back to the future. The train falls down, nose dives, um, smashes to bits. Yeah, like that. And um, so he gets safely to 1985. Then a freight train destroys the DeLorean. He, man he barely escapes with his life, manages to get out just in time. And so it's a very dramatic turning point. Um, you know, it's destroyed, it's gone. All those adventures we've had. So it's like a bit like the death of a friend, you know, they've lost that, that the vehicle, they could never go back in time again. And of course he'll never see Dr. M. Brown again, so that's very sad. But it was destroyed like he wanted. Dr. M. Brown did say when all this mess is sorted, I'll have it dismantled. And then later Dr. M. Brown appears in a in a railway train again, this one with modifications, one that can go backwards and forwards in time. So, uh, is that good or bad that he did that? I thought the moral of the story was, we don't need time travel anymore, it's all over, we don't need it anymore. Oh, but apparently we do, we do need it back. <laughs> I'm not too sure if that's um, good or bad, but uh, I don't know. I suppose the reason we, we had to have the tra railway train is because we had to have a really cool ending like the end of the first one. The first one ends with the flying car, so let's do the equivalent of that. A train that can fly with anti-gravity. That's the answer, yeah. And, um, yes, what about the uh, the future of... Um, oh, yeah, you know, just one little thing I'll say before this. Uh, at the end, what I thought was going to happen at the end of Back to Future 3 was this. I thought, we're never going to see Dr. Brown again, so that's sad, but he's happy. He's in a time period where he's happy. So that that's, that's a good thing. He's found love, and he did say his favourite period in history was the old west so it's sad we won't see him but at least he'll be happy then a split second later he appears and says you don't need to worry about me i'm okay now what about the um so what about the future of uh back to the future well there were rumors there might be a fourth one i remember two of my friends saying there's going to be a fourth one set in dinosaur times but then when i um uh, when I th then I realised the mistake was there was a Back to the Future ride at Universal Studios and in the ride with the screen you see dinosaurs but it's not an actual film though, it's just the ride so that's why, where, why there was that confusion there was a Back to the Future cartoon but um, in it they, they we do see the flying train again you know, the one that can go back and forth the time. we also see um, a new DeLorean that's been made which is kind of insulting to the original DeLorean what about that really dramatic bit when the DeLorean was destroyed? You know, we're never going to go in the DeLorean again. Oh, no, it's okay, I'll just make another one. <laughs> That's a bit silly, you know. Because of the way Back to the Future 3 ended, it's it's as if we can't have the DeLorean ever again. I don't know, maybe a cartoon was a good idea, but they could have made it, um... Oh, I don't know, um... 
set between two and three, or between one and two, or something like that. But no, no, they didn't. It was set after the events of the Back to the Future 3. But me personally, I think three films was quite enough. We don't need to see any more. And I saw the cartoon when I was a kid, and I'll be honest, it was like a bad version of the cartoon Bill and Ted's Ex Excellent Adventures. So, um, <laughs> ironic really, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventures was made because of the success of Back to the Future, then they did a cartoon, and then Back to the Future did a cartoon because of the success of that cartoon. And, um, okay, a little bit of cynicism here, um... The Back to the Future films were unique in that they're action comedy. You know, action with a lot of comedy elements, as well as science fiction elements. However, in the year 1981, there was a movie called Time Bandits. Now that has a lot of... it's a totally different story, but it has time travel with a lot of humorous elements in it. So Back to the Future wasn't the first to do that. It was the first very successful film to do that. But no, Time Bandits came up with the idea first, of putting comedy with, with, with time travel. And also, um, there's one...